Okay, so we're, we're going to move ahead. Thank you for, uh, for that. And, uh, Presenters. So uh, both Shai present their perspectives. Obviously, uh, Philippe will focus on the uh, non-US uh, European perspective and Shaji will focus. So now that um, we checked out and made sure everybody's awake with all those questions, we can move on to the next part. Rajkumar just mentioned, in a treatment of my treatment and just gets more and more a multiple questions do and all right so when you think about the myeloma treatment paradigm I think you know we increasingly talk about myeloma treatments being very complicated and that's probably true when you deal with those patients who have had multiple relapses and plenty of choices in terms of what we can use for combinations but when you think about the newly diagnosed patient it is a far more simpler we already heard about the diagnosis and the risk stratification. More or less, the, I think the community is unified in terms of how we stratify these patients and who is eligible for a stem cell transplant and not. And you already heard about what the initial therapy for these patients would be uh, in terms of the triplets. Um, and you also heard the debate about using the monoclonal antibodies. But once this patient's uh, disease is under control, we know that if we just don't do anything, these patients are all going to relapse in, a, in the short term. So we really want to keep up the pressure on the tumor cells here. We want to give additional therapy to consolidate the benefits that we got from the injection therapy and continue uh, the disease control for the as long as we can. So there are two different goals. So the injection therapy is really focused on the disease control and reversal of the symptoms and signs. And in the long run, we really want to give them consolidation and maintenance therapy to maximize the disease control and also with an eye on limiting the long-term toxicity that these drugs may be associated with. But the common goal is same. We want to get the tumor burden to the least level possible, and preferably in many of these patients, if we can get them to an MRD negative state, that is definitely a better outcome in the long run. So after injection, how do we provide consolidation therapy or maintenance therapy? Do we do a stem cell transplant? If you do a stem cell transplant, do we do one or two? Can, do we need additional post-transplant consolidation, and do, or do we need maintenance therapy? First of all, how long do we need to continue the injection therapy? Now, this is a retrospective study that in the CIBMTR that looked at patients who had um, a, a less than a partial response to the initial therapy, and in those patients, if they got an additional salvage therapy before going to a stem cell transplant versus directly going to a stem cell transplant, there was no difference in the progression-free survival or the overall survival after the stem cell transplant, suggesting that the change in therapy that patient needed was really the stem cell transplant. Now, obviously, this is retrospective data, but where they actually looked at patients getting a uh, cyclophosphamide lenalidomide dexamethasone or cyclophosphamide thalidomide dexamethasone injection therapy. And if they got only a partial response or minor response, these patients were randomized to getting uh, tumor cycles of botasmib cyclophosphamide dexamethasone versus directly going to a stem cell transplant. And the data clearly showed that there was an improved progression-free survival if you gave an additional line of therapy before going to a stem cell transplant, but there was practically no difference in the overall survival outcome uh, for these patients. So I think there's fair in the whenever each one new drug gets approved, we start asking the question, do we really need an autologous stem cell transplant anymore? So this is data from the, um, the Italian group suggesting, again, using high-dose melphalan versus using a consolidation with melphalan prednisone uh, lenalidomide, you clearly see an improved progression-free survival and an improved overall survival for a stem cell transplant. The criticism here has been maybe the melphalan prednisone regime, um, lenalidomide is not really the best comparator looked at the contemporary regimen of botasimib lenalidomide dexamethasone. So randomizing patients to getting a stem cell transplant or just um, lenalidomide botasimib dexamethasone containing injection therapy. And the schema is as shown here. And what you can see is that when you do a stem cell transplant, you do get a higher response rate 
and also a deeper response in patients getting the stem cell transplant. So you have almost a 14% improvement in the minimal residual disease negativity amongst the patients who went to a stem cell transplant versus the ones who just collected the stem cells and continued on botasumib and Dex. Now this translated to a improved progression-free survival, uh, as you can see here, uh, for the stem cell transplant. And as of the most recent follow-up, there is no improvement in the overall survival. So what does this trial tell us? I think it gives us two important messages. I think the most important message is, if you, in a transplant eligible patient, the stem cell transplant after that initial injection therapy should be considered the standard of care, and you should encourage the patients to go to a stem cell transplant. But at the same time, if the patient does not want to go to a stem cell transplant, I think it's reasonable to tell them that collecting the stem cell and doing it later on is also an acceptable approach. What, what do you do after this patient has had a stem cell transplant? Do we follow that up with a second or a tandem autologous stem cell transplant? Or do we give additional consolidation therapy with the regimens like the botasumib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone? Or do we directly go on to a maintenance therapy? Now, there are two trials that have directly looked at this question. And I'm going to talk about the one that was done in the US and the conclusions from that. And Dr. Mora is going to talk about the EMNO2 trial and how he would interpret the data from that uh, trial. So the STAMINA trial actually looked at patients uh, who had a single autologous stem cell transplant. Um, and obviously, these patients are registered and randomized prior to the first transplant. And they were randomized to a LEN maintenance alone, or getting four more cycles of botasumib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone consolidation, or a tandem autologous stem cell transplant. And all these patients uh, had lenalidomide maintenance. Now, when you look at the primary endpoint of this trial, there's absolutely no difference in the progression-free survival between the three different approaches. And um, again, the overall survival is also comparable, again, with the caveat that the follow-up this study is relatively short at this time point. So I think the recommendation for patients who are getting a botasumib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone injection therapy, as is the most common practice in the US, um, and getting a single autologous stem cell transplant there is no role for giving a botasumib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone consolidation or a tandem autologous stem cell transplant. We can move directly to a lenalidomide maintenance. However, you also want to take into consideration there's some data from uh, the European uh, clinical trials uh, and the data from this um, multiple phase three trials is going to be updated by uh, Professor Kawad in this meeting. But the initial um, data clearly showed that in patients with high-risk disease, the 414 translocation and the 17P deletion, those patients clearly seem to benefit from getting a tandem autologous stem cell transplant compared to a single autotransplant. Now, there's also the prospective data from the EMNO2 trial, which again demonstrated that there is benefit, for the high, especially for the high-risk cytogenetics patients, to getting a tandem autologous stem cell transplant. So what do we make out of these two uh, trials, where again, we don't have the high-risk cytogenetic data from the stamina trial yet. But I think it's reasonable to uh, have the discussion with the patient who have high-risk myeloma about um, considering a tandem autologous stem cell transplant. Now, what about the maintenance therapy? Now, we have the, this meta-analysis, uh, which uh, incorporated the data from three different phase three trials, demonstrating that if you have a single autologous stem cell transplant and move on to a lenalidomide maintenance, you gain approximately two and a half years in terms of survival, overall survival. And it seems to benefit the vast majority of the patients, with the exception of those patients who have high-risk disease. So this particular figure here shows the ISS stage three patients not deriving as much benefit. And there's additional data from this trial also showing that patients with high-risk cytogenetics also don't derive much benefit from a lenalidomide maintenance. What do we do for those patients? I think we can use the data from the HOVON trial, which looked at the combination of a botasumib-based regimen versus a traditional VAD-based induction therapy. And again, a botasumib-based maintenance versus thalidomide maintenance demonstrating that there is an improved overall survival for patients getting botasumib-based therapy at induction and maintenance. And this benefit seemed to be much obvious, much more obvious in patients with high-risk uh, cytogenetics. So what's the recommendation? I think for all the patients who are getting a botasumib lendex injection, a single autologous stem cell transplant, the current standard of care uh, would be to put them on lenalidomide maintenance if they have standard risk disease. And if they have high-risk disease, then consider using a botasumib-based maintenance. Now, obviously, uh, for the patients with the high-risk disease, we are always looking for newer strategies. Now, this is retrospective data from 
the MRI group, again showing that if you have a 17P deletion and you give these patients a botasumib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone based uh, consolidation or maintenance, however you call that, uh, you have actually a much better than anticipated overall survival, uh, suggesting that a more intense approach to maintenance in these high-risk patients may be warranted. So what are the eligible and upfront stem cell transplant after four to six cycles of induction therapy with a proteasome inhibitor imid based combination, uh, irrespective of the depth of response is the current standard. Certainly, uh, a delayed autologous stem cell transplant is acceptable in situations where the, you, you, the patient cannot immediately proceed to an autologous stem cell transplant. If you are giving four to six cycles of a botasumib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone induction therapy, an additional consolidation post stem cell transplant with the same regimen is not warranted. Now, this might change as we have more drug classes available, and if you can give a triplet therapy which does not, which have newer agents which are non overlapping with botasumib and dex, maybe we might at some point in future use a consolidation approach as well. Tandem transplant is not the standard approach, at least in the US. In high risk myeloma, it's a discussion that you have to have with the patient. And finally, lenalidomide maintenance uh, is a standard of care for patients with standard risk disease and patients with high-risk myeloma, a botasomy-based maintenance therapy should be considered. Now, I'll stop there and thank you for attention. So, on the U.S. perspective, so I will give now some data on the Euro keeping in mind that in Europe currently it is 11th to be awakened for, for this talk, in fact. And uh, these are the current European guidelines, very simple guidelines. Uh, for those patients that are eligible for stem cell transplantation, we are proposing in triplet induction, then stem cell transplantation prepared by ML200, and maintenance with LEN until progression. And in to these guidelines, we are not proposing a systematic consolidation. We are proposing a single stem cell transplantation. And we are never proposing a delayed stem cell transplantation. And we are proposing stem cell transplantation in patients less than 66 years of age or fit patients less than 70 in good clinical condition. And why are we proposing systematically upfront stem cell transplantation. This is based uh, on the results of two important trials. The first one is the EMN02 study, the Euro study from the European Consortium, with an induction with VCD up front, and then patients were randomized to no stem cell transplantation up front with VMP or stem cell transplantation. And the results are very clear, and they were presented twice at ASH by Michele Cavo for progression-free survival, stem cell transplantation up front is associated with a better progression-free survival as compared with VCD followed by VMP alone. And this is the French study published in the New England, RVD eight cycles versus RVD plus stem cell transplantation frontline and the maintenance fixed duration of one year in the two arms of the study. And you show this slide, the progression for survival is in favor of the early frontline systematic stem cell transplantation. 50 month median PFS versus 36 month with RVD alone. And when looking at the prognostic factors from, for progression for survival, the most important one is the achievement of MRD negativity. And the best way of reaching MRD negativity into this study is to use stem cell transplantation frontline versus RVD alone. You see the impact of stem cell transplantation to achieve MRD negativity 80% by seven color flow cytometry. And when patients are reaching MRD negativity, the overall survival is improved with seven color flow and also with NGS at the sensitivity threshold of 10 to the minus six OS is improved both before maintenance and after maintenance. So if you want to use stem cell transplantation upfront, you will reach a higher level of MRD negativity rate 
and subsequently your outcome will be improved. So when looking at stem cell transplantation, we don't have to speak only about, only about consolidation or maintenance, but induction is very, very important, and Brian discussed about induction. What is the role of induction? We need to have a fast control of the disease. We need, if possible, to achieve high response rate and MRD negativity with minimal toxicity. And it should allow, as well, an adequate stem cell harvest to be able to perform uh, the, the frontline stem cell transplantation. And in Europe, the two standard of care were VTD and VCD, and more and more, and you heard about some uh, polls here, we are using uh, VRD as well. VRD is widely used in the US. It's, deep, it's probably less toxic as compared with VTD, and it is, at least to my opinion, as effective. So it will be the future in Europe as well. And it could be easily uh, proposed up to six cycles of VRD based on the Spanish experience. And the Spanish experience is very, very important uh, when comparing VTD versus VRD. This paper was published in 2012 by Laura Rossignol. And in this study, uh, our colleagues from Spain used, before stem cell transplantation, six cycles of VTD. And you can see that the VGPR rate or better is 60% and you can have an adequate stem cell harvest of almost four millions of CD34 positive stem cells. The same cooperative group published recently uh, some data on VRD prior to stem cell transplantation. Same group, six cycles, and you see that the VGPR rate or better is 68%. It was 60% with VTD. And the stem cell harvest is also very good more than four millions of stem cells. But when comparing the toxicity of VTD versus VRD, and this will be presented by Laura Rossignol during this meeting, you see that the peripheral neuropathy rate is highly decreased with VRD. So you can use VRD up to six cycles very easily. And the same group looked at MRD data, and with six cycles of VRD upfront, you can reach a very high rate of MRD negativity at the threshold of 10 to the minus 6, 35% of the patients. That's a very high proportion of the patients. So how to improve on these results and what will be the future? During this meeting, we are going to hear some data on KRD upfront and I cannot show you any data, but please go and listen to Francesca Gay in, uh, in two days from now with very good results with KRD up front. But what we did with the French group and the Hoven group, we looked at the prospective comparison of VTD versus VTD plus daratumumab, and we looked at MRD negativity after four cycles of either VTD or VRD, and uh, VTD or VTD dara and the results will be presented at the next ASCO meeting. So these are two ways of improving on the induction part that is very important for the outcome of the patients. And this study will start very soon in Europe. What we are going to do, we are going to compare VRD upfront versus VRD plus DARA prior to stem cell transplantation and VRD versus VRD DARA during the consolidation part of the study. So we are going to establish probably that the quadruplet combination is able to improve on the MRD negativity rate and the outcome of our patients. So we are not systematically proposing consolidation into our guidelines, but what is the role of consolidation? A short duration after stem cell transplantation in order to increase the quality of the response, the depth of the response, and to, with the reduced toxicity to allow maintenance. So what are the tools and what are the issues? We can use novel agent-based consolidation or second stem cell transplantation. Is it necessary? What is the best option and what is the optimal duration of consolidation if needed? So these data were reported by Michele Cavo quite a long time ago, five years ago, and Michele will update these results meta-analysis of phase three uh, trials in Europe comparing, a, so I encourage you to listen to this oral presentation tomorrow. 
What we did also with the French group, we compared VTD auto without consolidation versus VTD auto and two cycles of VTD consolidation. And the PFS is improved when you are adding two cycles of VTD after stem cell transplantation. So we do have some data supporting uh, consolidation or a tandem stem cell transplantation. And into the recent EMNO2 study, uh, in the stem cell transplantation arm, VCD and auto, some patients were treated with a single stem cell transplantation, and some patients were treated with a tandem stem cell transplantation. And Michele Cavo reported at the last ASH meeting the outcome of single versus tandem stem cell transplantation in terms of PFS, and two is better than one. And for overall survival as well, two is better than one, and you see the hazard ratio is 0.5, supporting uh, the role of a tandem stem cell transplantation in young patients eligible for stem cell transplantation. And this is especially true for high-risk cytogenetics, but when also you are combining revised ISS2 and free uh, for overall survival, tandem stem cell transplantation is better than single. And you can see the hazard ratio is quite good, 0.5 and 0.48. So we do have some data supporting uh, for high-risk cytogenetics, especially tandem stem cell transplantation. This study also looked at VRD consolidation after the induction part in a randomized fashion, two additional cycles of VRD versus no consolidation. And again, the study was uh, updated last year at ASH. You can see that with VRD, uh, consolidation, the progression-free survival is improved with a hazard ratio of 0.8. So we do have some data supporting the role of consolidation. And when you are looking at the results of the Spanish group, six VRD induction, stem cell transplantation, and two additional cycles of VRD consolidation, at each step of the strategy, you are increasing the MRD negativity rate at the threshold of 10 to the minus 6, that is a very important one. So, Shaji, I think that we can use easily two cycles of consolidation VRD, and we are increasing the MRD negativity rate. That is a very, very important endpoint into our trials. And if I'm looking carefully at what you are proposing at Mayo, Vincent, and yourself, for patients with high risk, consider tandem stem cell transplantation. So that's okay. Michele Cavo would agree with you. I'm not Michele, but Michele will tell this tomorrow for sure. <laughs> so what about the US study, stamina study, a very, very interesting study design. After stem cell transplantation, patients are randomized to no consolidation, VRD times four, or a second stem cell transplantation. The, the study design is optimal, very high number of patients, maintenance until progression in the free arm. So I'm perfectly okay with the study design. But when you're looking at the compliance uh, for a patient point from the patient decision or physician decision, you see that only 68% uh, of the patients who are allocated to the tandem stem cell transplantation arm did receive the tandem. So if you are taking out patients from a uh, uh, study, of course, the results will be totally biased, to my opinion. And similarly, 12% of the patients that were supposed to receive four cycles of VRD consolidation did not receive the four cycles for physician or patient's decision. So we should look at the per-protocol analysis, and the results are the following uh, regarding progression-free survival. The two best arms of the study are those with the tandem stem cell transplantation or auto followed by VRD. So a very good study design, but many patients were dropped out, and I think that the study is very difficult to analyze at the end of the day. But I agree with you, we still have question marks regarding the role of consolidation, uh, and I think that outside clinical trials, we may recommend tandem stem cell transplantation in patients with high-risk disease. What currently we are doing uh, in Europe is also looking at the impact of daratumumab as part of consolidation and 
Cassiope will demonstrate probably that a quadruplet combination is very effective in increasing the uh, rate of uh, MRD negativity. So what about maintenance? And we know that we need sustained response following stem cell transplantation. And I'm showing you exactly the same uh, um, picture of the impact of LEN maintenance into this meta-analysis on 1,200 patients. LEN maintenance is improving overall survival. That's a very, very important point. But we know that in this study, patients with high-risk cytogenetics and ISS3 does not seem to benefit from LEN maintenance. But we also have some data coming from the UK group and myeloma 11 study also looked at LEN maintenance versus no maintenance after stem cell transplantation. And our colleagues from UK that are outside Europe, UK is no longer in Europe, <laughs> are also showing that LEN maintenance is improving not only standard risk patients, but also high risk patients. So we do have some conflicting data regarding LEN maintenance and nevertheless, we are proposing LEN maintenance for the majority of the patients. Can we use proteasome inhibitors? And Shaji, you showed some important data with bortezomib maintenance uh, effective in high-risk patients. During this meeting, we are going to hear on the results of the Tourmalin 3 study, the comparison of ICSA maintenance versus placebo following stem cell transplantation, a very important study, and Thanos Dimopoulos will give this oral presentation. And this is the picture from the abstract book, in fact. You see that ICSA maintenance is improving the uh, progression-free survival by five months as compared with placebo. So maybe LEN is interesting. This picture is showing that ICSA is also interesting so why not combining these two oral agents? And this is what the uh, Spanish group is currently doing, in fact, after stem cell transplantation and after consolidation. Patients are randomized to receive Lendex maintenance or Lendex plus Ixazomib. So a very important academic trial looking at the impact of a combination and a PI and an imid. And the Spanish group is also showing nicely that into this study, looking at the best response achieved when you're reaching MRD negativity uh, at 10 to the minus 6, the outcome is very, very good. And some patients here uh, are potentially cured of their disease with the combination of a good induction, a good consolidation, and a good maintenance. We are also looking at DARA maintenance into the uh, Cassiope study, and uh, a second randomization is comparing DARA during two years versus no maintenance. So in conclusion, the European perspective are the following. Frontline stem cell transplantation and not delayed stem cell transplantation is standard of care. VTD and VRD are probably the best induction regimens prior to stem cell transplantation. The optimal consolidation has to be defined, and we are more and more using tandem in high-risk patients, and we need to uh, consider the global strategy, and we have to try to improve uh, each step of the procedure. And I thank you for your kind attention. So thank you so much uh, for both of those presentations. Uh, certainly from the second presentation, you can see that there are some uh, mild uh, differences of opinion, perhaps. Uh, so do you have some comments, uh, anyone on the panel first? Vincent, what about tandem? What about consolidation? What about the stamina? Just, uh, just I, I think people just have to understand what's going on. There are two randomized trials with a very similar question. Uh, one done in the U.S., one done in Europe. One says there is no benefit of transplant, the trans second transplant, and there is no benefit of consolidation. So the U.S. trial basically found that if you gave a transplant, then you can go straight to maintenance because by giving the VRD consolidation, there was absolutely no benefit in PFS or overall survival. And by doing a second transplant, there was, again, no benefit in PFS or overall survival. The European trials found the exact opposite that there was a benefit for tandem transplant and there was a benefit for consolidation. 
So when you have two trials, which are both led by great investigators, large studies, exactly opposite results, what is a person supposed to do? So what about the 32% of people? It really depends on where you are located. You literally have any salvage option you can think of, you can get it. So, daratumumab, bilotuzumab, bilotuzumab plus daratumumab therapy that they want. Then, based States and you have a well insured patients with access to everything, they probably don't get any more benefit from a second transplant or consolidation. That's the reality of the US trial. In Europe, you just told me how many patients could get daratumumab off study, and the answer was zero in, in the um, uh, Cassiopeia trial. So, when access to salvage is limited, it becomes even more important because the transplant. There is no access, then I think you should consult a conductor. All right. Oh. I mean, cycles prior to autologous transplant only receives three cycles. And we look the benefit of a second trans. Uh, cons is 4%, it's not that much. So I I'm personally think that uh, the benefit of consolidation depends on the quality of the treatment prior to, auto uh, prior to consolidation. And it will be even more true with a patient, 50% of patients achieving MRD negativity after a transplant. Do they I certainly agree with that. Uh, the number I of cycles. I fully agree. Yeah. I fully agree. I think it's right. really pertinent. I think right. using the using a different regimen for the consolidation is probably what. If it has to be something totally different. On the induction, if you are going. And if the efficacy was moderate, then... Uh, right. Uh, I also I agree, think with, I agree we, with that also, yes. Brian, we, we have very... ...data in a... Uh, ...one year before stem cell transplantation. Some of them did receive Lendex. Some of them VRD, and I think that the quality of the response impacts a lot. So this is also a pitfall of stamina. But to be honest, and I did not mention this during my study, patients are either receiving VCD, single stem cell transplantation, no VRD consolidation right. and maintenance, or VCD, single VRD consolidation, and maintenance, or VCD, tandem, no VRD consolidation, maintenance, or VCD, tandem, VRD <laughs> consolidation, and maintenance. So at the end of the day, we have too many groups, and the study is not powered to demonstrate that one group is better than the other. So stamina is not optimal, EMNO2 is not optimal as well. So question mark regarding the role of consolidation, but I agree with Jean-Luc, maybe when you are reaching MRD negativity after six cycles of VRD, single stem cell transplantation, you don't need consolidation, but this has right. to be demonstrated in a randomized fashion with a uniform. Very, very good points. I fully agree. Yeah. So here. So Tony Blau. So to what extent are these decisions individualized according to a patient? So I, I have myeloma. I looked at my M spike as it went down with RVD, second cycle progressively. And then, you know, I don't know, maybe between the fourth and the fifth cycle, you're not getting a lot. And then at All for Cure, we have boards. We have patients that got a first. Mm -hmm. 
Very, very good individual yeah. comment, yes. <laughs> well, we so, always have to take patients' wishes into account in, and uh, okay. also patients' circumstances. Good that at least one of us is right. The question back here? Yeah. Uh, the, the question that was presented to the audience for patient achieve MRD negativity prior to transplant. And the consensus from the Mayo Group appears to be that they would not offer RVD consolidation post transplant and move on to maintenance. But what about patients who achieve, fail to achieve VGPR or better, or get a PR? Uh, does that <laughs> Uh, constitute an indication for VRD consolidation post transplant, and how about patients who actually have higher risk cytogenetics to begin with? For instance, the patient has deletion 17P and will fail to achieve VGPR or better. Is that a, a patient that you would consider VRD consolidation post transplant? Yeah, so, so I think so very, good, those, good, those are very good, good questions. I good, think good point. Yeah. Uh, the you know in terms of we still don't know the how to adapt the therapy to the depth of response in a given patient because there are no prospective trials showing that if you take somebody who is less than MRD and give them MRD negative, it's going to really impact the outcome. So I think we, um, at this point, outside of a clinical trial, we should deliver the entire induction, transplant, and maintenance therapy. Now, clinical trials are looking at that specific question to see if you enhance the therapy, is it going to make a difference in your randomized uh, clinical trials? Now, in patients with high-risk disease, I think we are willing to go out on a limb and say, these patients, whatever we have right now is not doing good enough for those patients. Shall we try something slightly different? Shown that the people got MRD negative, did all extrapolate the data, and all of us would feel comfortable giving additional therapy to try and get them to a deeper response. Right. So let's go ahead and see uh, how all of this discussion has impacted your thought process. How do you view the role of uh, repeat the case so you can see? So this is a 17P minus uh, in a significant percentage of cells. Uh, and so completed uh, four cycles. So the number of cycles you can see uh, becomes uh, perhaps more important than you were thinking. Uh, and so what would you do next? So four cycles, what would you do next? Aha, uh -huh. number six. Oh my, there we go. So tandem. With RVD, oh, so we have tandem, wow. Uh, so 